I'm Julie Phillip and thanks for joining me for this edition of Need to Know. This week the National Transportation Safety Board released its final report in the crash of flight 3407. 49 passengers and crew along with one person on the ground died when the commuter plane smashed into a Buffalo suburb on February 12th of 2009. The NTSB report concludes that pilot error was primarily to blame but the board is also recommending Colgan Air, the operator of the regional flight, implement numerous safety improvements, including better pilot training. That probably comes as no surprise to PBS Frontline producer Rick Young and correspondent Miles O'Brien. In an investigative report due for broadcast next week, the pair will document problems they uncovered following that fiery crash. In a minute, we will talk to Miles O'Brien, but first, Need to Know brings you a sneak preview of Frontline Flying Cheap. We're not talking about average, we're talking about human beings who are flying my grandmother to Buffalo, right? Okay, so there are people there living this life, and it seems as if they're in an untenable position economically. Absolutely not, because there are many other people who, who, um, who learn, earn less money than that, who work more days in, in these communities that can afford it and do do it and do it responsibly. I just checked the, the web th this morning. You can get a hotel room at the Newark airport for $50 a night. $50 a night, if you're making $20,000 a year, mm -hmm. that adds up, doesn't it? Adds up very quickly. If you have a base salary, roughly $1,200 a month is what you take home. $50 a, $50 a night for a hotel is going to disappear relatively fast. And, of course, I don't know if you've ever tried to find a hotel at that rate near Newark, but... It's most likely not going to be in the uh, safest of neighborhoods. Low pay and high living costs have created an underground housing market in the airline industry. They're called crash pads. Some regional pilots let us inside their crash pads in a northeastern city if we agreed not to reveal their location. You can picture a, a one and two bedroom apartment with eight, 10, 12, 14 guys in it on, you know, roll out mattresses and sleeping on the floor, sleeping on the couch, uh, sleeping in bunk beds, air mattresses, waiting in line for the shower. What they were like. Well, I had a crash pad in Albany, New York. We had nine people living in a small two bedroom apartment. We had guys living on the, sleeping on the couch. They rented the couch. Guys that run out of closet, a big walk-in closet. And then you'd have three or four guys crammed in a little a bitty 10 by 10 room. Hardly bigger than jail cells, it seemed like. Sleeping on air mattresses. We couldn't afford to rent our own apartment. We just did not make enough money to be able to pay for that. The lives of regional pilots may not be glamorous, but they offered young pilots a fast track to the captain's seat. At the major airlines, it took pilots on average seven years to upgrade from first officer to captain, but not at the regionals. At Colgan, uh, I upgraded very quickly. Within my first year, I upgraded in about nine months, if I remember right. Boy, in nine months you were a captain? Yeah. That, that's, that's quick. Almost scary, isn't it? So that's, a, yeah. a, that's not a deep reservoir of experience in the cockpit. We now go to our sister station in New York City, WNET, where Miles O'Brien is standing by. Miles, thank you for joining us today. Julie, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Would you explain why the Buffalo plane crash, as several people in Flying Cheap say, was such a watershed event? Well, you know, it's interesting. On that night a year ago, on that final approach toward Buffalo, there were so many factors at work that kind of funneled into that cockpit, which made that crash happen. They were trends that had been building for a long time in the airline industry that a lot of people inside the airline industry were fully aware of, certainly the pilots. The fatigue issues, the work rules issues, the pay issues, the training, and the fact that these regional airlines, commuter airlines, uh, had become such a dominant player in the airline business. Fully half, actually a little more than half of all our flying now is done on these regional airlines. And so uh, all of that kind of funneled in as factors on that accident. And that's when you get a watershed, when all these things that are kind of at play and have been a source of concern lead to an accident. Unfortunately, we saw a lot of these things coming and uh, not much was done about it. 
We have seen a lot of reporting by the general media since that accident about the safety of these regional airlines. But really, this is these airlines are so important to the economies of small cities like Rochester and Buffalo. Uh, so, you, so it's an economic story. It's a political story. It's a safety, personal safety story. How did you boil all that down into a one-hour uh, front line? Well, you know, as you know, when you do television, it's hard, and there's an awful lot of interviews and a lot of material that ends up on the cutting room floor. You really have to kind of boil it down to the essence of the story. And what we discovered, as you, point, you know, showed in that clip, was the story that was told by the pilots themselves. The, the, the people had, who had lived this life was so compelling and so revealing to all of us. To see those crash pads and the conditions they live in uh, spoke volumes about how the industry had evolved. You know, we could have gone on and on and talked about you know experts and trends and circadian rhythms and and what the the impact of all this schedule and pay and commuting is on these people all you have to do though is just look at that picture of that crash pad and suddenly you understand the life of these people who are flying you from point a to point b and you hope, hope safely so uh, it was it was difficult and yet it all kind of came down to a few pictures and a few key interviews too this is the first time that some former Colgan uh, air pilots have spoken out publicly since the accident. How did you get in touch with them and get them to open up to you? Well, I'm a pilot, and I uh, converse with a lot of pilots, and uh, there are some forums where pilots uh, exchange information, professional information, uh, reaction to events, whatever the case may be. And, and we just sort of dove in that water and started asking for you know what that people thought about the regional system and the way the airline business had evolved we were just absolutely flooded with response and then on top of that we went to some existing colgan pilots who of course will remain nameless who couldn't come forward and we asked them if there were some recent departures from Colgan who'd be willing to share their story. Because obviously, working for the airline, they weren't going to come forward and talk. They'd lose their job in an instant. So uh, it actually was um, not that hard to find people because there's a lot of people out there who feel very strongly about this. Chris Wyken, who's in that clip you just showed, who told us about his experiences really wants to see this changed. He's left the business now, but he loves flying, he loves aviation, and he saw an industry that was not at all what his dream was all about. It's pretty clear from that clip as well that industry officials not so eager to talk about um, the Buffalo crash and the, and the problems with the industry. How hard was it to get that side of the story? Well, you know, of course, we tried repeatedly to get people at Colgan and the company that actually uh, ha now uh, owns that Colgan subsidiary, Pinnacle, to talk to us, and, and they refused. Um, we also, just ancillary to all this, uh, attempted on repeated occasions to try to get into a, a simulator to try to get an, an idea of what happened on that night uh, flying into Buffalo. We were shut down on that regard as well. It all came down to the Regional Airline Association, Roger Cohen, who you saw in that clip as well, who uh, basically uh, sat down and, and sat in the hot seat uh, for us and, and took the heat for an entire industry. It would be nice to hear from the industry a little bit more, uh, from the big players. Uh, also, Continental Mainline didn't want to talk to us. We got Gordon Bethune, who is now out of Continental, but it was a driving force of Continental for many years. Uh, he spoke a little bit about uh, Continental and the regionals and the, the history behind it. But the fact is, the people who are sitting in those offices now, who are responsible for the safety of all of us who fly on these airplanes, would not hold themselves accountable to uh, us in, these, in this documentary. And I think that's unfortunate. I think they owe us more. I think it's telling, too. And I think people are wondering why there seems to be a different standard for pilot training and, and experience for these regional airlines compared to the major airlines. Can you explain that at all? Well, there's one set of rules. The FAA sets you know, the bar at this level uh, for, for all the airlines, large or small. That's a change that occurred back in the mid-90s after a series of crashes then. It used to be there were two sets of standards. Now there's one set of standards. But the FAA standards, many would suggest, are too low. The regionals absolutely meet the bare minimum of the FAA. The large players, the Americans, the Continentals, the Deltas of the world, go way above and beyond those FAA minimums. Uh, there's a lot of reasons they do that. Obviously, crashes are not good for business, if you want to be crass about it. But also, what they have discovered is that there's a series of safety measures that they can take, which actually help them on their bottom line. If they monitor, for example, the performance of a pilot more carefully using computer systems and so forth, they can find out uh, problems 
problems with um, uh, the way they're flying approaches, and that can help them, for example, with brake wear and uh, fuel consumption and that sort of thing. So they save money by putting in these safety systems. The problem is they're very expensive to get up and running, and the smaller players don't really have the capital to do it. And so they end up kind of scraping along at the bare minimum the, of the FAA standards, and it's not the same. And here's the rub. When you get on that flight in Newark to Buffalo or the one that goes to Rochester, it says Continental on the tail. And you think you're getting Continental service and safety. But the truth of the matter is, this is a regional airline that is operating by a different set of rules at the bare minimum compared to uh, what Continental does. And so I think a lot of it is just people need to be aware that they are getting a different level of service than they anticipate, and it doesn't necessarily reflect the paint job and the logo of the airline. Now, you uh, have covered the aviation industry for a long time. You're a pilot yourself. What surprised you most during this uh, frontline investigation? Well, I think the thing that surprised me most was, the, you know, just the, 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 the almost aviation sweatshop that we have created in all of this, that pilots are uh, put through... Um, you know, let's face it, no, nobody's forcing them to take these jobs, but they, they go into these jobs with the hope that they will one day be the captain of a, you know, 747 or a 777 flying across the ocean. So there's this huge carrot that's out there, and they're willing to sacrifice tremendous uh, amounts of, you know, of sleep and, and, and commute long distances and get paid poorly to do that. But um, what, what I didn't really fully appreciate was how much that was affecting safety. You know, uh, people say, well, nobody's forcing these people to commute. But if you're making 16 or 18 or $20,000 a year and you're based at Newark, the New York City area, you're not going to be able to live in that area in, in any reasonable way. So they commute. They live in, in, in towns that are much less expensive and they come in. And so what, what that does is that puts them you know, sort of behind the eight ball the minute they begin their trip. And they're young and they're eager and they want to fly, but the, the, the situation is almost um, it requires superhuman effort to, to fly these jobs. The other, the other thing that was very interesting to me was how quickly uh, these people who fly for these airlines uh, end up in, in captain seats. There's not a deep reservoir of experience in these cockpits in both seats. Okay, we just have about 30 seconds left. What do you uh, think frontline viewers should walk away with after watching it next week, Miles? I, I think they should walk away, number one, with their eyes wide open about what they're, what they're flying. When you go to the internet, when you go to Travelocity or Orbitz and you click on that ticket, make sure you see who's, who's operating that flight. Make sure you understand a little bit about who's actually flying the flight. It might say Continental, it might say Delta, but it's actually another company. So do that, number one. And number two, insist. Uh, push wherever you can if you have the opportunity to get some rules changed so that those smaller players, uh, the bar is raised for them. And they, if the bar is raised for all of them, they all have to play the same set of rules. That's, that'll work fine. It's just when, you know, you can't, asking these people in a very competitive business to unilaterally increase their safety levels and spend more money is a difficult thing. Thank you, Miles. Uh, we look forward to Frontline. Julie, it was a pleasure. Miles O'Brien is a correspondent for PBS Frontline, Flying Cheap. Miles joined us from our sister station, WNET, in New York City. You can watch PBS Frontline, Flying Cheap, Tuesday night at 9, right here on WXXI.